This episode of Metatrex is brought to you by Enterprise in Space. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter. Visit enterpriseinspace.org for more information. And if you'd like to help us keep Star Trek discussion coming to you each day, consider becoming a patron of the network through Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm and find out how you can become part of the team. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. This is Tim Russ. Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. There's no greater challenge than the study of philosophy. My philosophy is that there is room for all philosophies on this station. Welcome, everyone, to episode 36 of Metatrax, Trek FM show on Star Trek and philosophy. My name is Mike Morrison, and with me is Zachary Fruling. Today, we have the privilege of talking about the philosophical concepts behind a brand new, Zachary, a brand new Star Trek feature film, Star Trek Beyond. Mike, I'm so excited. This is something we've been talking about for months. And what an exciting time to be a Star Trek fan. We, we just got a new Star Trek movie. We have a new Star Trek series on the way. Years from now, we're going to look back on this particular year and think what a great time it was to be a fan. I'm so excited to talk about Star Trek Beyond today. Yeah, without a doubt. I don't get tired talking about Star Trek. It, it, you and I have, have said this many times. This is the fun thing that we get to do every week. I get to sit down once a week with a friend and talk about Star Trek, this thing that I absolutely love. And it never gets old for me. We have literally talked about every iteration of Star Trek. We've covered some of the uh, movies. And here we are, Zachary, getting to talk about a new Star Trek feature film. This is a good day. (laughs) You know, Mike, it's actually kind of a challenge for me to talk about Star Trek Beyond today because for for most of the Star Trek canon, it's really already deeply ingrained in my mind. I've watched it again and again and again, and I have sort of a deep working knowledge of the threads in those episodes or in the movies that I think are really important. And with a new movie like Star Trek Beyond, it's still processing for me. So I've picked up on a few threads that I'm looking forward to talking about today, you know, philosophy-wise inside Star Trek Beyond. But I have no doubt that it will make more sense as I watch it again and again, you know, even as it gets released on on blu-ray and, and online i'll watch it uh, you know countless more times i'm sure i, I like i, I love the movie so i'll be watching it again and again but um for me I, I feel like uh like most of the star trek canon it'll take a little while for it to sink in and really understand the full import of all the threads that we're going to talk about today mm. when you first said this was going to be a challenge for you i thought are you out of your vulcan mind <laughs> 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 you know for for me zachary yeah certainly there there are there are some philosophical threads that you and I are going to mine out of these initial viewings. Uh, You've actually been able to see it twice. I saw it once uh, so far on opening night. I plan to go again uh, here this next week, but you're right. Mining these deep philosophical threads out of this is somewhat of a challenge, but I have to say this is one of the things that I really appreciated about this iteration of the Kelvin timeline, the Abrams verse, JJ Trek, whatever fans, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it, this particular iteration, I felt had a deeper philosophical uh, leaning than the than the other two. For me, Zachary, Star Trek 2009. I remember very very well. I was so excited. Star Trek back on the big screen. And I read all the hype leading up to it. We were going to visit the Kirk, Spock, and McCoy characters. We were going to catch them earlier in their careers, uh, perhaps when they were in Starfleet. They cast some relatively unknown actors, with the exception of Zach Quinto, who those of us who are fans of Heroes uh, know Zachary Quinto from Heroes. But otherwise, these were all pretty fresh-faced actors. And... Going into the theater, I I just found myself so disappointed because I felt betrayed, honestly, uh, that they had taken this thing that I love so much and they had kind of blown it up and and uh, done something new with it and literally blew up Vulcan, which, you know, for me, I, I was just so upset when I when I left the theater and it took a little while for me to warm up to Star Trek 2009. 
but going into Star Trek Into Darkness, I, I was finally over it and I was starting to really appreciate Star Trek 2009 for what it was. And then they, they announced that they were bringing um, Benedict Cumberbatch in to play the villain, John Harrison. And I'm like, John Harrison, who? I don't care. It's Benedict Cumberbatch. I was so excited. But then, you know, the, just the disappointment, the letdown, I literally left the theater angry. I was I was infuriated uh, after that movie, and it took me uh, a good while before I really even appreciated the things that they did right in that movie. So I approached Star Trek Beyond with... Uh, I often referred to it as cautious optimism because I just, I did want to get my hopes up, you know, fool, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. And so I just didn't want to, I just didn't want to have that let down. So I remain cautiously optimistic, but I've got to tell you that I left that theater remembering what it was that I loved about going to see Star Trek in in a, in a movie theater. Don't get me wrong. I still think the TV is absolutely the right place for it, but there's just nothing about the spectacle, nothing like the spectacle of going and seeing it on the big screen. So I, I love this movie top to bottom. I, I just, I think it was fantastic. Well, Mike, I had a slightly different experience watching Star Trek 2009 and Star Trek Into Darkness. I was one of these people that really loved Star Trek 2009. I mean, it was not the Star Trek I expected. Um, it certainly passed the 80-20 rule for me. I loved the, the the actors that were cast, the reboot of the franchise I thought was interesting. Visually, it was a fascinating movie. Um, you know, we had Leonard Nimoy playing Spock again. That was exciting. And so it definitely worked for me more often than not. And I, I, I think I saw that uh, Star Trek 2009 movie in the theater probably eight or nine times. I loved it so much. Um, fast forward to Star Trek Into Darkness, and there was nothing about the previews leading up to Star Trek Into Darkness that I found really exciting or captivating. Um, I, I went into that movie sort of thinking, something's wrong with this one. It's not capturing my imagination. And sure enough, when I got to the, to the theater, it didn't capture my imagination very much. It... Um, you know, it fell flat flat for me philosophically. Uh, I think the attempt to parallel Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, fell flat for mm -hmm. me. It just didn't generally work. Even though I love seeing the actors and, you know, they, they, they capture some essence of the characters very, very well. So it's, it's always fun to see this group of actors on the screen doing their thing. Even in Star Trek Into Darkness, there were some brilliant character moments that, that I really enjoyed. Um, and, and actually, I had to warm up to Star Trek Into Darkness. Uh, we did, you and I did an episode of Metatrex on Star Trek Into Darkness, mm -hmm. Metatrex episode 20, Bay of Targs, uh, in which we talked about some of the philosophical themes in, in Star Trek Into Darkness. So if you want to hear us talk about Star Trek Into Darkness, go find us on Metatrex episode 20. You can hear all about our, our take on that film now. But I've learned to at least appreciate Star Trek Into Darkness for its philosophical import. So that, that was my viewing of Star Trek 2009 and Star Trek Into Darkness leading up to this movie. And even the trailers leading up to Beyond, I was still, uh, I was still fairly skeptical. I, I didn't see anything in the trailers that, that really uh, made my heart go pitter-patter. It was... Uh, I was frankly thinking, oh, here's another another action movie. Are they going to put some philosophy into this? I, you and I have talked previously about some of the things we'd like to see into the movie, themes of colonialism and, and whatnot. Um, and th so I was still a little skeptical, though. And so I, I go to see the movie and I loved it. It was it was really the, the most fun I've had going to see a Star Trek movie probably in almost 20 years. Uh I, I, I'm not one of these people who, who hates on Star Trek Nemesis, and I, I, I really liked Insurrection. You and I have mm -hmm. talked about Insurrection before. Um, but certainly it was probably the most fun I've had going to a Star Trek movie since probably First Contact or, or Generations, the excitement leading up to, to that movie. So, uh, yeah, it was thrilling. I've seen it twice. I saw it a, a, an early release um, when it was uh, released Thursday night, and I saw it again last night before we recorded. So it's fresh in, in my mind. But, Mike, before we get started talking about our actual initial thoughts on the movie itself, um, we should say a word to our listeners that, that we've made a little change in our in our Metatrek schedule. We had planned to do an episode of Essential Philosophical Trek here on Metatrex tonight. We, we uh, have planned to do Essential Philosophical Trek every uh, four episodes on Metatrex, in those episodes divisible by four. So if you were waiting for us to do Essential Trek Philosophy here on Metatrex, we're sorry, but we could not wait one more day to talk about Star Trek Beyond. So we're going to do that tonight. We're going to do Essential Trek Philosophy next time. Yes, as a matter of fact, Metatrex 37 will be Essential Deep Space Nine Season 7, so 
be sure and join us for that. Well, Zachary, shall we uh, shall we dive in? We've sort of already given our initial thoughts, but uh, any any other initial thoughts that you have on the movie before we dive into a few of these philosophical threads that you and I have uh, have latched onto? You know, I, I think the thing that I enjoyed most, you know, and before we get into talking about philosophical issues and beyond, I think the thing that I enjoyed most about the movie was the subtlety with which they captured the, the nuances of, of the characters. Clearly, these actors have found their their groove in terms of how they relate to each other, in terms of their, their ability to capture the nuance of the characters. Um, and it was really just fun to see them problem solve with each other. I mean, we, th- this was a bad day on the Enterprise and Star Trek Beyond <laughs> to this to the extent that we've never really seen, frankly, in Star Trek. I think, you know, we've seen the Enterprise blow up and we've seen very bad days in Star Trek. But this is a bad, bad day on the Enterprise. It was fun to see the crew taken outside of their, their normal environment on this very bad day on the Enterprise, get rid of the ship, take away most of the crew, and have the core cast be forced to problem solve and work together as a group in a way that we really haven't seen this new cast. I call them the new cast. They've been around for a long time. The new cast <laughs> of, of Star Trek. They, um, we haven't seen them problem solve together in such a high stakes uh, way with so few resources at their disposal. And it was just fun to see them put, you know, get together into a group and have a Captain Picard style boardroom meeting on the uh, on the bridge of the USS Franklin, uh, trying to, you know, reason their way and solve, you know, problem solve their way out of this terrible situation there. And it was so much fun. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Probably, probably as much as as anything, because that's something I always enjoy watching when I'm when I'm checking out a Star Trek episode, there's always that boardroom scene or that scene where they're in the re- in the ready room or they're having a chat in the corridor. They're, they're trying to solve a problem. I think it was Rene Descartes that said, divide each difficulty into as many parts as it takes to solve it. And so here they are kind of divide and conquer. You're right. They, they, they've lost the enterprise. They're having to solve this nearly impossible uh, problem that they've got, this situation that seems almost like a no win, but just in absolute Captain Kirk style, there is no such thing as a no win situation. They're going to work together and they're going to figure this out and everybody's got something to contribute. I really love that aspect of it. The only thing it was missing was a Geordi PowerPoint. Yeah, about the closest thing we have to a Geordi PowerPoint in, in Star Trek Beyond, Mike, is Spock trying to point out the location of Uhura's radioactive uh, tracking device necklace. He gave her a radio tracking device necklace. <laughs> <laughs> that that was a that was a great piece of comedy relief in there, I have to say. And th- again, that's what I think was really brilliant about this movie. It, it was it wasn't it wasn't in the action. The action was great. It wasn't in the effects. The effects were great. This movie was just well written, and I really have to give it up to Justin Lin and to Simon Pegg and those folks that got together and really returned, I think, this particular franchise to true Trek style. I'm thinking, Mike, of the opening scene when Captain Kirk is encountering these, what we find out are very, very short, non-humanoid aliens. And it it just reminded me so much of the original series. You know, I mean, the original series, there were definitely aliens of the week, most of which were humanoid. And there's this ongoing question, how come all the aliens in Star Trek are humanoid, right? And uh, I I think I remember Marina Sirtis giving a a clever answer to that question. Well, when we get some non-humanoid actors, then we'll have some (laughs) non-humanoid aliens. And of course, technology is to the point where you can bring very lifelike non-humanoid characters to life on the screen and it was just fun to see captain kirk encounter a a a strange planet a strange new world with strange aliens we've never seen before and of course it's it's just a lead-in scene that leads into the action of the movie and i'm glad at least that there was a thread of that of that scene that works its way through the rest of the movie so many times um you know these scenes are just uh, introductory scenes. I'm thinking of the introductory scene in Star Trek um, Into Darkness. You know the scene on Nibiru. Uh, you know these the red planet with the with the strange looking aliens mm-hmm. that didn't have much to do with the rest of the movie. And I'm glad they at least found a way to weave in the introductory scene to the rest of the movie. But um, you know this is this is part of what I love about Star Trek. You know I I do love the philosophy. We do meta treks together to talk about all these philosophical ideas. But Star Trek for me is also a human adventure story. You know I want to see what's out there in in the in the galaxy that we 
haven't discovered yet. I mean, that's part of the reason they're on a ship in the first place is to go encounter strange new worlds. So th- there was so much in this movie that thrilled my imagination from the opening scene with the strange aliens to, to seeing this incredibly uh, expansive space station, the Yorktown. All of this was just fuel for my imagination. It was kind of a, sco- a scope and a scale to the Star Trek universe that in, in a movie that we haven't really seen so much before. Zachary, you failed to mention, I'm extremely disappointed, you failed to mention the USS Franklin. The Franklin. The Franklin. The Franklin. Franklin. Yes, that that ship. I, I, I love the kind of nod to Enterprise era starships. Uh, with with that particular design it was it was brilliant it, but you you were talking about the opening sequence and for for me i think it just calls back to what i said a moment ago about just how well written this uh this edition of star trek was that scene had a little comedy it it was it was unexpected i think that was the word i used when we were talking in the turbo lift it was a very unexpected scene and you know the 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 alien was interesting and and there was a there was a humorous aspect of it i love the fact that captain kirk can joke a little bit about himself i ripped another shirt uh, you know just just a little humor in there for those of us who are original series fans because it just seemed like every week as you said alien of the week Captain Kirk always comes back from the away mission with a ripped shirt, and and that's always that's always been a, a little a little bit of a running joke among uh, original series fans. But you know, here they are, kind of laughing about it too. And it's funny because as I sat in the theater, you could tell who in the theater were really original series fans because those were the people laughing at that joke. And Mike, I'm glad you mentioned the USS Franklin because it reminded me of the scene in Star Trek IV when when Captain Kirk has to tell the crew, a ship is a ship. You know, it doesn't matter what ship we get. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, can, you can have an adventure. You know, if this crew can have an adventure on any ship, it doesn't have to be the Enterprise. And it was fun to see them, you know, have this ratty old, you know, warped four ship, which is great. I'm a starship wonk myself, so I love seeing new starships. I, I wish we got to see a bit more of this one, frankly, all the all the. Uh, scenes of of the USS Franklin were a little fast and you didn't get a chance to look at a lot of details. I would like to have dwelled on the the exterior of the ship a bit. But it's just a testament to the fact that with this crew, you can put them on any ship at all. It doesn't have to be be the Enterprise and they can rise to the occasion and solve the problem and have a spectacular adventure. Indeed. I I hope that the Franklin will make a cameo in Star Trek IV. (laughs) Whatever it may be. Right. Well, we have the Enterprise A, so that's a good you know, call back to Star Trek for itself. Yeah, we have the Enterprise A. We didn't get to see a whole lot of it, and I've seen some mixed reviews about it. Frankly, I, you know, I, I didn't see anything I, I thought was, you know, off-putting about it. Uh, what little bit we got to see, but you know, they've got plenty of time. They'll tweak that, I'm sure. And by the time we get Star Trek Four, I'm sure it will be just as glorious a, a starship as the original 1701. Uh, was uh, for those of us who are fans. Well, you know, Mike, for for me, the the litmus test of any Star Trek movie is, frankly, at the end of the movie, I want to be, I want to feel inside, like I want to be sitting on the bridge of that ship, ready to warp off into the unknown and explore the galaxy. And this movie did that for me. It made me want to be on a starship. And you know, what what purpose does fiction serve if it doesn't fuel your imagination to have these kinds of visions? You know, like I want to be on a starship. Yeah. And and this movie really fired my imagination. Um, Two thousand nine did something very similar for me, but Star Trek Star Trek Into Darkness didn't. This one re you know, recaptured my love of, of everything Star Trek. That's very well said. And I, I just, I, I just agree with that wholeheartedly. And, and I have been somewhat critical of the Kelvin timeline, JJ verse Abrams verse, again, whatever listeners want to call that. But I, I have to say this, this really redeemed it for me and it just restored in me an appreciation for Star Trek in all of its glory for, you know, for for what it's meant to me over the course of really my entire 45 years. 
If you had talked to me a week ago about this, Mike, I would have said that I'm ready to twilight the Kelvin timeline, that let's do these three movies and then let's move on. Let's get back to the prime timeline. Let's stop going to the past. Let's go into the future. And that was basically my position on on the Kelvin timeline. In fact, I said as much on a recent uh, appearance of mine on The Ready Room, uh, Trek FM's flagship show. I was co-hosting that show with Chris, the founder of Trek FM, and I basically observed that I'm pretty much ready for the for the uh, Kelvin timeline to be twilight. Let's do this movie and then let's get back to to basics in Star Trek, keep moving forward. But really, this movie changed my mind. I had such a good time seeing Star Trek Beyond, and now I'm really excited to see what they're going to do with a fourth movie now that a fourth movie's been announced. And I think that fundamental shift from really continually, no matter how much I love Star Trek 2009, I was still skeptical that this is the direction Star Trek should go. And of course, there's a part of me, a big part of me, that will always love the the prime timeline and the mission of Starfleet to keep moving forward into the unknown. That, to me, connotes going future uh, into the future in time not into the past but um, you know this was such a great story and I had such a good time watching it I and the and the cast have matured so much in their relationship to each other and their ability to capture the nuances uh, and the writing was so good I'm totally optimistic that the next um, Kelvin timeline movie will will again capture everything that, that's essential to Star Trek you know the trajectory that they're on is a trajectory I'm, I've become happy with yeah I concur I, I am so ready for the next one I, I really am and and I would have never said that a month ago, but I am I am ready for the next one, whatever whatever it may be. I hope I hope that they will take this formula, realizing that it works and duplicate it. I, I, I really I'm really hopeful that that's the case. And I think that there is really some things about Star Trek Beyond that I can honestly say I hope that Brian Fuller will pull into uh, Star Trek Discovery. I, again, I wouldn't have said that a week ago, but uh, I can say it now that I, I really think there are some elements here that uh, Brian Fuller can certainly pull in to make Star Trek Discovery everything that uh, I think it can be. It's actually kind of funny how wishy-washy our intuitions can be. You know, we've been talking, you know, following a certain line of reasoning about the Kelvin timeline for quite a quite a few months and, and years now. Uh, and then, you know, it all turns on a dime. You know, we're presented with some counter evidence in the form of a new movie. We loved it and we were totally willing to admit we were wrong and we're ready to go uh, see, the, see the fourth movie when it comes Yeah, out. I'm ready for the next adventure and I'm ready to dive into some of the philosophical threads from Star Trek Beyond. Shall we? Yeah, well, like I said, Mike, this was actually kind of a challenge for me. I wrote down several possible things we can talk about, and we're going to hit on some of these. The first one on my list was um, just an observation of the fact that it's it's actually, I'm actually kind of disappointed we didn't get a chance to talk about this last week when we did Metatrex, when we talked about the Divine Comedy. Because I think, interestingly enough, we see both Kirk and Spock in a very dark place midway through their five-year mission. In fact, almost to the day, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think in Star Trek Beyond, they named the number of days, and it's something like, uh, you know, 900 days, you know, just short of their... 966. I love that you wrote down 966, Mike. I, did, I didn't remember <laughs> the actual number. But it did strike me that this is about halfway through their five-year mission. And, of course, when we were talking about the Divine Comedy last week, we were talking about midway through life's journey. You know, Dante finds himself, you know, lost on, you know, in a dark wood. And that's essentially the the mental state that we find Kirk and Spock in. Both Kirk and Spock are midway through their journey. Uh, They're feeling in a dark place, not sure what path they're supposed to be on. And I like the existential... Um, you know, questioning that's going on in both of these characters, you know, halfway through a mission, you sort of think, wow, five years out in deep space, that sounds phenomenal from a Star Trek standpoint. Who wouldn't want to be on that mission? And and if you remember back in, in Star Trek Into Darkness, Kirk was extremely excited to be going on a, uh, on a five-year mission. Yeah. And here we are halfway into it and it's become routine. Even, even meeting, uh, you know, the alien of the week, you know, in fact, he calls it episodic. And I, I got a, a huge chuckle out of that mm-hmm. when Kirk says that it's become a little episodic, yes. uh, you know, <laughs> after all this controversy about whether Star Trek should be episodic or not episodic. Um, you know, I, it was interesting to see Captain Kirk feel like his five-year mission has become monotonous. You know, he puts on the same uniform every day. Every time he meets a new alien species, it's just the same old routine. The, the exciting has become monotonous. And that everydayness of something that to us looks like like a, a fundamentally exciting state of being, being on this five-year exploratory mission in the Star Trek universe, that is totally in line with this existential everydayness tedium that that existentialist philosophers have talked about for the last hundred years or so. That everyday, 
uh, boringness quality, you know, <laughs> you know, when you, when you, you know, have to wake up and, you know, take a shower and brush your teeth and go to work and do the things you're going to do. However exciting those things look like, you know, to other people, there's an everydayness quality and it's starting to take its toll on, on Captain Kirk in particular. And I thought it was just fun to dwell on that for a few minutes and, and see that not every moment on the enterprise, even the new shiny enterprise mm-hmm. is, uh, an exciting, um, an exciting moment. So yeah, it's just, it's just this fundamental existential, um, you know, everydayness tedium that that speaks to me in the opening scenes of, of Star Trek Beyond. Well, I'm really glad, Zachary, that you're drawing a line here to Dante's Inferno. I wrote this down, and it strikes me just how much this sounds like. It, it sounds like Dante. Listen to this. This is Captain Kirk's log. I won't read the whole thing, but quote: Captain's log, star date twenty two sixty three point two. Today is our 966th day in deep space, a little under three years into our five-year mission. The more time we spend out here, the harder it is to tell where one day ends and the next one begins. It can be a challenge to feel grounded when even the gravity is artificial. (laughs) Sounds like a a line straight out of Dante, frankly. It really does. I mean, if Dante were a science fiction writer, I I really believe that that could have come from his pen. The thing about that line of reasoning, Mike, that, that I find interesting is that it forces you to ask the question about what mean what the meaning of life is, you know, the meaning of your experiences. Captain Kirk, for better or worse, chose a life in Starfleet and and, and he, he accelerated, you know, into his current role far faster than other people. Uh, you know, he's an extremely young captain of a starship at, at the age that he's a, a captain in, in, in the uh, Kelvin timeline. But this kind of existential questioning forces you to ask what the meaning is. And, and, and I like seeing Kirk's musing and reflection on the meaning of, of his current role as captain of the Enterprise. Captain Kirk is really forced to, uh, you know, examine his own role as captain of the Enterprise in relation to his his father and his father's death and in relation to, you know, what what the purpose of their mission is. And uh, it, it's, it's this incredibly sort of self-reflective uh, introspection uh, right smack in the middle of what's ostensibly ostensibly a very action filled movie, and uh, I, I like seeing the slow, uh, introspective character um, uh, dialogue uh, in, in a movie like Star Trek Beyond. I love that as well. In fact, just to just to kind of go back and revisit that whole situation from Star Trek 2009 and what it's meant, what it's done to forge uh, this this particular iteration of Captain Kirk, that crucible and, and, and the effect that it's had on him. In fact, Captain Kirk and, and, and Bones are having this conversation and Kirk says to Bones, you know, my dad joined Starfleet because he believed in it. I joined on a dare. And Bones says, essentially, you joined to see if you can live up, live up to him. And he goes on to say, you've spent all your time trying to be your father. And now you're wondering just what it means to be you. Zachary, that's incredibly deep and reflective. It's it's the kind of thing that we we expect from Star Trek, quite frankly. And I, I really appreciate the fact that we are examining these characters, as you said, introspectively. We're we're digging into the nuts and bolts of their own personal philosophies and and seeing how their circumstances are really shaping them into unique characters. I mean, this is something that William Shatner, Captain Kirk couldn't possibly relate to or understand in the same way that Chris Pine, Captain Kirk can. So I really appreciate the way that they're bringing these, these unique nuances to these characters. And even though there are many, many things that the two captain captains Kirk have similar, uh, they're also uh, very, you know, very distinct differences. Well, Dr. McCoy helps Captain Kirk ask the sort of fundamental existential question. He asked him, you're wondering what it means to be Jim. And, and every one of us has to ask that fundamental question of ourselves. I have to ask, what does it mean to be Zachary? What has it meant so far? What does it mean today? What will it mean next year or 10 years from now? You have to ask that question about your mm-hmm. life. And what, and and at any given moment, you can go one of two directions. You can feel constrained by all of your past experience and, and, and Captain Kirk to some extent does feel constrained. You know, he continues to struggle with the situation with his father's death. He continues to struggle with his role on the enterprise. We see the existential tedium of that in Star Trek beyond. And, 
Um, and I guess the, the, the fundamental existentialist insight is that at any given moment, you can either feel inauthentic and feel like you're constrained by all those factors you can't control, the past or otherwise, or you can embrace the facticity or the, the, the reality of your present situation and decide to own it and, and really embrace your role. And by the end of uh, Star Trek Beyond, we see Captain Kirk really finally embracing his role as captain of the Enterprise, not just doing it out of duty, not doing it trying to be his father, not doing it um, out of necessity in an emergency. It's it's something that he realizes can actually be fun. And I just like the simple fundamental point that at the end of, of Star Trek Beyond, he says, you know, what fun is it if you don't get to go out and fly anymore? Yes. <laughs> you know, do ad- do vice admirals fly? And, you know, the, the admiral uh, tells him no. And he says, well, what fun is that? No, you know, you know with all due respect. <laughs> and, and that's a fundamental point. All of us are like that. You know, at any given moment, we can say, look at how tedious today is going to be. Or I can say today is going to be a fun day and I get to be on whatever adventure I'm on and I'm going to make that part of who I am. And it's fun to see Captain Kirk make that existential shift towards really embracing his own, I don't want to say destiny, but embracing the reality of his own situation and really making it part of who he is as opposed to who his father was or who everyone wants him to be. Well, and I love that because in, in, in many respects, Kelvin Universe Kirk is somewhat wiser than Prime Timeline Kirk because it really took Prime time, Timeline Kirk uh, a, a huge mistake, a huge career mistake for him to learn that lesson. And yet, you know, here is uh, Kelvin verse uh, Kirk who recognizes, you know, in his own life. And I want to draw this idea about living up to your father. And, and I, I say this to all of our, all of our uh, male listeners out there. I, I know that we all have that uh, kind of, dilemma in life there's a there's a point in life where we we just we idolize our fathers and we're just trying to live up to our fathers but then there comes a place where we try to figure out how to be our own man and so i I appreciate that that line of 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 reasoning that again that introspective uh sort of discovery of you know kirk coming to that place to where he has to he has to figure out how to be his own man and it's interesting to me because Prime Timeline Spock had that same issue. Uh, we we saw this crop up from time to time. He and his father uh, lived their lives with, with friction between the two of them because Spock was considered to be, I think, to some degree rebellious because he was trying to figure out how to be his own man and not just you know, not just live in the shadow of his father, but to be his own man. So rather than, you know, be, uh, you know, be a member of the science directorate or to, to serve at some capacity on Vulcan, he goes out, he joins Starfleet. And, he, you know, he, even even in the uh, uh, prime timeline movies, you know, Spock and his father kind of have this uh, this conversation back and forth where Spock's father, to some degree, validates him by saying, you know, your your associates are are people of good character, and that was validation for Spock, and, and it, that the kind of validation that he needed to to have the freedom to really be his own man. So I I really like the way that they kind of flipped this in the Kelvin verse without being cheesy about it. There's a nuance to the action that occurs in Star Trek Beyond that I I almost missed it twice, and I'm glad I picked up on it a little bit the second time I watched the movie. When um, the Enterprise is attacked, and it's clear that the Enterprise is going to be lost to, to this uh, these events that, that happen in Star Trek Beyond. I'm trying not to give too many spoilers. In fact, I feel like I should have given a spoiler alert at the beginning of the episode, but as it becomes clear that the Enterprise is going to be lost, Captain Kirk basically orders everyone to abandon ship, and he's going to remain behind and try to do what needs to be done. And this is something very analogous to what his father did, right? His father ordered everyone off the ship and he stayed behind. Mm-hmm. And it occurred to me that even right up right up into, you know, halfway through Star Trek Beyond 
on, Captain Kirk is essentially imitating the actions of his father. And I didn't pick up on that the first time around. And uh, the second time I, I watched the film, it occurred to me, oh, he's doing the exact same thing his father did, you know, ordering everyone off the ship. He's going to stay behind. And, it, you know, w- w- fortunately, the situation ends up very different. And this is one of the the, the, the themes of the, of the movie that we can talk about a little bit. It's not really a philosophical point, but it's an important theme of the movie. Um, this theme of togetherness, being part of a crew, being part of a group. Um, you know, thankfully, the rest of the crew doesn't give up on Captain Kirk and he doesn't give up on them. The crew don't give up on each other and they stay together as a group. And even as they get distributed, even if they, as they don't know whether each other are alive, the being a member of that team is a fundamental part of the identity of this particular group of people. And there are no uh, individuals on the Enterprise. <laughs> and I think that that's a fundamental point that, that Captain Kirk, you know, even though he's ordering everyone off the ship, no one's going to give up on him either and, and vice versa. And um, Scotty basically tells as much to Jayla in, in the movie that, you know, this is what it means to be part of a crew. We don't give up on each other. Uh, we're not going to leave you behind. We're not, you know, we have your back no matter what. And and that, and because of that close togetherness of this particular group, I think the situation unfolds very differently for Captain Kirk than it did for, for Kirk's father. We get to see some some really great vignettes of what that means, too. And you're right. The, the ideals of Starfleet are really kind of put out here on display, in particular, the idea of unity. Uhura and Kroll are talking about this idea of unity. In fact, he suggests to her many times that this isn't a strength this is a weakness she's she's telling him my captain's going to come for me and she she's saying to him yeah i sacrificed myself because that's what we do but my captain's going to come after me we're united and there's this great kind of back and forth between uh kirk and crawl where crawl suggests to kirk that uh, that unity is a is a weakness, not a strength. And you know, Kirk comes back to him and and you know tells him, no, that's not the case. Uh, we see that displayed in these little vignettes of action. For instance, when Kirk is betrayed by the female alien, her her name escapes me. We finally figure out that you know she's going to betray him, and you know Chekhov shows up and stuns her. So you, we get to see that idea of I've got your back. We're in this together. Uh, Spock and Bones. Uh, Spock is injured, and he says to says to Bones, he said, "Leaving me behind will significantly increase your chances of survival, Doctor." And I love the Doctor's response to him, and it's such a such a Bones response. He said, "Well, that's damn chivalrous of you, but completely out of the question." <laughs> <laughs> so we get to see these these great little vignettes of what that looks like. You know, we're not just talking about unity, but we're showing uh, we're showing you what it looks like. And I, I just I just love that. It's very Star Trek. Well, the juxtaposition of every character on the Enterprise who does feel like the rest of the crew has their back. And you, like you said, you see these vignettes of of the of two or more characters having to look out for each other inside Star Trek Beyond. Wonderful, charming vignettes. The contrast between any of those members of the Enterprise crew who have each other's back no matter what and and the antagonist, Balthazar Edison, who real, slash crawl, who really does feel abandoned by the Federation and abandoned by, uh, you know, everyone who, who, who he knew. Uh, and you can see what the, the sort of poison that caused in his own mind, you know, magnify that by, by decades and decades. And, uh, you know, it's just a, a stark contrast between between the, you know, an approach to, to life where togetherness is the fundamental assumption. And that's part of your identity, who you are as part of the Enterprise crew versus really feeling alone and rejected and abandoned and uh, and the poison that can create in your mind. Yeah, absolutely. Back to the back to the thing with Captain Kirk and his own self-discovery. I don't want to step away from that too quick. Because I, I I think there was a really interesting conversation that took place, and I, I I think you could almost overlook it if you're not careful, and that is the conversation that Kirk has with Commodore Paris, and they're talking about uh, the the vice admiral position, and Kirk is alluding that he is struggling, he's he's having some difficulties, and he's he's sort of indecisive about what his future is because again he's. He's still trying to live up to his father. He's trying to figure out, you know, how to be Jim Kirk. And I love what Commodore Paris says to him. She says to him, quote, It isn't uncommon, you know. It's easy to get lost in the vastness of space. There's only yourself, your ship, and your crew. And so I love the journey that the writers take us on in Star Trek Beyond because we go from that scene where that seed is planted and Kirk realizes 
that the 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 best version of himself is captain of that starship and he realizes that this isn't a tedium this is really who i am it's me my ship and my crew and that's enough well we've observed before on metatrex that the role of captain of a starship is the most existential role of any role that we see in the star trek universe that's because you literally have nothing to fall back on you know if the federation is far away you have to make demand uh, decisions in the moment on the fly you can't fall back on principles you can't fall back on experience you can't fall back on rules you can't fall back on 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 uh, the the power of the fleet being right there behind you you've got to be in the moment making decisions and it i think like the the commodore observes it's just very easy to feel lost in that situation you feel the entire weight of everything on your shoulders with really nothing but your own decision making to guide you and i could and i don't know if we feel the weight of that so much but i think we feel the the angst of that in, in captain kirk and star trek beyond he's starting to feel that it's tedious he's not sure if he wants to be in that environment it's easy to want to retreat to a safer course when you have radical that form of radical responsibility with nothing to guide you yeah i really appreciate again the journey that they go on and it's not just captain kirk it's really the whole crew because and in and, and many respects zachary it's it's art in imitating life because i feel like just as the crew has discovered the best versions of themselves and they've really discovered what it means to to really be a crew I think that's true for the actors and for the people who are making this particular iteration of Star Trek. I feel like they've they found themselves artistically and the whole thing's kind of come together and gelled. And we, we see that in, in this storyline because at the end of uh, Star Trek Beyond, there is this really great kind of conversation. And I, 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 I love the in the theater, the way the three, you know, Kirk, Spock and McCoy are sort of looking up at the, at the sky that of course they're in uh, the, the Yorktown and they're probably looking through some type of observation window, but they're looking out beyond that window beyond into the stars. And they're having this conversation and, you know, bones says to uh, captain Kirk, you, so you, so you want to go back out there, huh? And, and you can, Kirk doesn't even have to give an answer. You can see the answer on his face. He, he can't wait to get back out there. And for that matter, with all of uh, bones's uh, grumblings and mumblings, he wants to get right back out there too, because he knows the best version of himself uh, is right there in that, you know, in that trifecta of, of wisdom, uh, Kirk, Spock and McCoy, he knows that's the best version of himself. Yeah, and I and I, I still like the fundamental point that it just wouldn't be any fun to stay behind and let the ship go off without you, right? He doesn't. He he wants to be on the ship at that point. It's more fun that. Oh way. yeah, it's just more fun. <laughs> well, Zachary, one of the things that popped out to me, uh, philosophically speaking, you and I actually we had a we had a, a meeting of sorts on Saturday, and we were talking about our initial impressions, and I had mentioned to you that I found it very interesting the journey that Spock is on in this movie. He it's taken a little while. He's been thinking about it for for a long time. Um in fact, uh, I, I, Emmanuel Kant said live your life as though your every act were to become a universal law and i really feel like that's that's the way spock lives his life it's very deliberate and he's he's very reflective and not so much prime timeline elder spock that spock has learned to loosen up that spock doesn't take himself so seriously but this is this is young spock and zachary quinto really captures that uh, so very well he's 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 evaluating his obligation to his people, and we don't understand that at first. All we know vaguely is that he and uh, Uhura, Lieutenant Uhura, have have parted ways. They've they've broken up, and in fact, it's it's so subtle at the beginning. You're kind of even wondering if that's the case. She's trying to give a necklace back to him, and you know, Bones is asking questions, and he's kind of tight lipped about it. He receives word that Ambassador Spock has died, which I, I want to talk about uh, for just a moment uh, when I'm when we're done here, but uh, you know the, how that affected him. But he is trying to weigh what his obligations are to the Vulcan people. You know, as as Bones said, so you think you need to find a Vulcan woman and make Vulcan babies. 
<laughs> That's what he's struggling with. And is he being selfish by indulging in this relationship with, with Lieutenant Uhura? Well, like we observed at the beginning of the show, both Captain Kirk and Spock are kind of on a, a different existential journey. They're both questioning their own path, uh, their their place in life, you know, what direction they want to go. And um, while Kirk's is, is existentially interesting to me as a captain of a starship, I think Spock's dilemma is the more philosophically interesting uh, dilemma. And the question he's basically asking himself is, do I have an obligation to my species or to my race? You know, given that it's been decimated by the destruction of Vulcan, does he have an obligation to, like you said, you know, marry a Vulcan woman and, and you know, raise Vulcan babies and and uh, and and live the rest of his life that way to help you know f- propagate the future of his of his own race. And to me, that just raises a very interesting philosophical question that is analogous to the kinds of questions you get in environmental ethics um, about our obligation to the rest of humanity, or even our obligation to future humans that don't exist yet. You know, what obligation do I have to? Um, you know, create an environment that future generations will benefit from? What obligation do I have to protect the environment in such a way that future humans have a good place to live? Those people aren't real yet. Um, just like, so Spock is basically asking this question, do I have an obligation to the longevity of my species? You know, given that it's been decimated, um, do I sacrifice the things I want to do in the here and now and my relationships with the people that are living and beside me right now, all for the sake of some obligation, um, a fairly abstract obligation to people that don't exist yet, future Vulcans in the repopulation re, uh, of, of his own species. If my memory serves, Zachary, from Star Trek 2009, there were less than 10,000 Vulcans who managed to escape the planet before it was destroyed. And so Spock has, Spock's been thinking about this since Star Trek 2009 and uh, what, what his obligations are. I think though, Zachary, there are some similarities between the conflict that the inner conflict that he's experiencing and the one that James Kirk is experiencing, because when Spock receives word that Ambassador Spock has died, Kelvin versus Spock, I think, has had this thought in the back of his mind. I think this is something that he has given a great deal of thought to. But I think he admires the fact that prime timeline Spock, Ambassador Spock, really embraced his position in this universe. He dedicated the rest of his life, those last few years, to trying to help his his species, his race, reestablish themselves. And so I think that has precipitated this idea in Kelvin vs. Spock's mind as he contemplates you know, do do I try to live up to him? Do I try to take his uh, his mission and make it my own? And I think that's the dilemma uh, that he's having. And, and the decision really is, do I try to be that Spock or do I just try to be my own Spock? It's very similar to the existential question that Captain Kirk's asking himself. There's 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 really great similarities there. I don't think I'm reading too much into it. What What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the similarity with Captain Kirk is that both characters are faced with this fundamental existential dilemma. And and I think any existentialist would come along and say, look, there's no moral obligation either way. That's a kind of excuse. What matters is each character's you know, first person introspection and asking themselves, what kind of life do I want to live? Do I follow a new path? Do I embrace the path that I'm on? And so there is this sort of fundamental existential similarity to the situation that they're in. But the situation as I see it for Spock is that Spock is feeling that he has an ac- an actual moral obligation to his species. You know, this isn't something that's just a question of what do I want out of life and what do I embrace? I mean, that that's true. He's doing that. He, it's still an existential question and, and, and he's in an existential a position of existential questioning. But, you know, if, if you sort of up the ante just a little bit and, and w- with someone like Spock, he's going to be entertaining the question, do I have an, ab- an actual obligation to, to do these mm-hmm. things? Uh, it's not just I think he wants to stay with Uhura. Right? <laughs> I think that right. I think that much is clear. I don't. I don't think it's a question of what he wants. I think it's a question of he feels an actual obligation. So I guess the question I have for you is, 
is the question of, of, of obligation. You know, is it, is it correct to, to think that it's not just a matter of choosing what path you want to be on, but do we have an obligation to these fairly abstract concepts? You know, for me, uh, and you and I are in a different situation personally in, in this regard, you have children and, and I don't. And so as, as I get into middle age, I start to ask the question of myself more and more, do I have an obligation to, you know, to propagate the things that I've learned, to take the the values and and the thing, the knowledge and the experiences that I have, and have children for the sake of passing those things on to a future future generation. I feel like as as I get older, there's more of a sense of obligation around those things and a desire to do those things than when I was younger, even as recently as a couple of years ago. And uh, I could see Spock entertaining a very similar uh, question. You know, as I get a little bit older now, do I have an obligation to my species, even if that make means making personal sacrifices for the sake of, um, you know, for the sake of his race or for the sake of his own, his own passing along his own family values or cultural values. Um, I think the, the, the deeper ethical philosophical question is whether or not there's an actual obligation to those things. Cause if, if you just leave it at the level of an existentialist choice, I think no, all of us, no matter what dilemma, no matter what moral situation, you know, there's an existential component of that. Which direction do I go? Do I go, do I go left or do I go right? Do I embrace the path that I'm on or do I try to fight against it? And, and any character that, that faces these questions has that going on in their mind. But from a ph- philosophical standpoint, you know, it's important to ask this ethical question, do we have an obligation to those things, or are those just one possible path among many? Well, the stakes are very, very high for Spock. In Star Trek 2009, his acting captain's log, he made the statement, quote, I am the member of an endangered species. Mm-hmm. You, and, you and I certainly don't have that... Uh, have that issue that problem we're we're not facing but the, but that makes the situation worse though right from a moral standpoint because you know if you're even have even a remotely environmentalist bent to your thinking if you think you have a moral obligation to the environment you know that means protecting endangered species doesn't that up the ante even more doesn't spock have even more of an obligation to those things given that situation if you're even uh, open at all to the possibility that we have anything like an environmental obligation or an obligation to the future the stakes are very high for spock so i understand the ethical dilemma he's found himself in it is it's 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 a very difficult question what you know what and and i think it's a personal question I don't think that there is a uniform pat answer to this. Um, uh, you know, I, I can, again, I can draw from my theological background, you know, in in creation, when God created each species, he told them to populate the earth, to, to multiply and populate the earth. And he gave that same uh, command to, to man and woman in the creation story. So, you know, in that regard, you know, do we do we have an obligation to do that? Well, if you're if you're if you're if, if you know if you're thinking of that in theological terms, then yeah, you know, the answer could could very possibly be yes. There's there's some obligation there to do that. But again, that was at that was at a time when the, you know there weren't uh, you know we didn't have seven billion people running around on planet Earth, and so. You know, I think that's an ethical question that each person has to ask him or his or herself. Well, I think this is one of these classical dilemmas, which whichever way you go, there's a philosophical problem with it either way. And so, you know, if you ask this fundamental question, is there an obligation, you know, in the situation Spock is in, does he have an obligation to his own race or not? Or here in the real world, do we have an obligation to the future? Do we have an obligation to the environment? Do we have an obligation for to have children and propagate our families or species or whatever, right? Um, you know, if the answer is, it's a yes or no question, right? And if you, if you answer the question is yes, you're forced into all these unhappy consequences, you know. Know, it's it's okay, it's right in that sense for Spock to do the unromantic thing and walk away from all of his friends for the for the sake of this moral obligation. I think all of us kind of cringe a little bit at that. Like, wait a minute, Spock, you're walking away from your destiny. You're walking away from what you really want. It's not existentially authentic in a way. And that I think, especially in this 20, 20th slash twenty first century, uh, largely existentialist perspective, we have that rubs us the wrong way because we place a lot of value in living an authentic life and living in a life that you choose that mm-hmm. is. Uh, especially here here in America, where we have we prize uh, individual freedom and liberty to choose your own destiny, right? So if you if you push obligation too far, you infringe on your freedom to control your own destiny. And so you know Spock's willingness to kind of walk away from all these things that matter.
matter to me rubs me the wrong way. I don't think it's a very satisfying answer. So that's one possible answer. Yes, you have an obligation. You walk away from all the things you care about and uh, live an inauthentic life. That's bothersome in a way. But if there's no obligation, that means there's literally, I mean, if there's literally no obligation, if the answer is no, you don't have an obligation to any of those things, then it's, uh, you know, uh, by analogy, it's okay to, you know, rape, pillage, and plunder the environment, you know, in the here and now, because there's no obligation to the future. And if there's no obligation, then what reason do we have to do anything good in in the world? And it just gives it gives everyone license to act however they want in relation to the future if there's literally no obligation to the future. So I think it's it's a problematic dilemma because I think either answer leaves something wanting. Yeah, and I and there's no, certainly not an easy answer for Spock. And I I don't know if it's the you know the virtue of the fact that you know we're looking at a at a two hour and three minute movie or you know the, the, that it just doesn't exist. But I appreciate the fact that he's he doesn't seem to be under any kind of pressure from the Vulcan High Command or his or his father. You know, this is something that I think Spock is trying to work out on his own. And again, I think. I think the death of Ambassador Spock precipitates that to some extent because now he's having to look at this ethical dilemma in, under under the the lens of you know do I do I take up his mantle and and follow in his footsteps or do do I do I take the existential route and be my own man? And I think that's, I think that's where we find him in this movie. I, I think, I think the, the, he'd already made an ethical choice. It's very interesting because oftentimes you have this kind of, um, a mentoring relationship with someone else. And Spock is in this weird position of having this mentoring relationship with himself. It's like, he's got a one man daddy complex. Yes. Or something. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very bizarre, but I think, I think leading up to this movie, Zachary, it's very clear. Spock's made his choice. He has an obligation to his people. I think that I, I think that he made the decision before we ever got the opening credits of this movie. He's he's broken it off. They've broken it off him, him and Lieutenant Uhura, and he is going to do what he feels he is ethically obligated to do. But again, I think the death of Ambassador Spock precipitates a reevaluation of that decision and 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 in some ways i think he recognizes that ambassador spock has transcended that sense of obligation to the point that he's able to be his own man and i think i i think kelvin vs. spock admires that uh, they have a they have a really interesting conversation in star trek 2009 i think that really puts the exclamation point on uh, on my point here but you know where where uh, the elder Spock is telling the younger Spock, listen, you, 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 and I'm paraphrasing, you, you know, you just have to learn to loosen up and, and, and live a little and, and be your own man and do your own thing. And I, I think that's advice that that he took to heart. So I've, I think the beginning of this movie, Spock's already made the ethical choice. He's going to take a Vulcan wife and, and he's going to help perpetuate a species. But uh, the death of Ambassador Spock has uh, reminded him uh, of something that I think he admired in his uh, parallel universe self. Well, the presence of the elder Spock, uh, you know, in this alternate timeline really provides the perfect uh, license for the younger Spock to be as rebellious as he wants, right? He knows that the older Spock is out there helping propagate the, you know, the, the Vulcan species, helping to rebuild their culture, and he can be a rebellious Starfleet member not doing what Vulcans do. And it's allowed him to sort of follow his own path almost as an excuse. You know, like, I can trust that, you know, the older Spock is taking care of business and I can, you know, be my authentic self here on the Enterprise. Once you take older Spock out of the picture... It may it forces this existential authenticity question of, you know, the excuse is gone. You know, now he really has to choose which direction he wants to go and what his obligations are and aren't. And no one can make that choice for him. And, uh, you know, there's no one to give him license to, uh, you know, be that rebellious uh, teenage version of uh, Spock that we see back in Star Trek 2009. So are you saying you don't think he uh, you don't feel that he's made the decision coming into this movie? I guess, Mike, this is something to me that still just doesn't quite make sense about the mental state that we see young Spock in at the beginning of Star Trek Beyond. I guess I don't understand the shift in his thinking to all of a sudden now he feels an obligation to to propagate his species 
you know, w- when we haven't even learned that old Spock isn't around anymore at this point. Uh, you know, Spock, young Spock definitely doesn't know that that old Spock has passed away. He learns that when he gets to uh, the, the Yorktown. But um, so I, I guess, you know, there's something that's happened in Spock's mind and he feels an obligation that he didn't feel, you know, the last time we saw him on uh, in a Star Trek movie. Uh, do you have a theory about what accounts for that that shift in his thinking all of a sudden? Is it just getting older than them? Is it kind of is it the kind of shift in, you know, uh, thinking about what your obligations are that comes normally with with getting older? I mean, I, I feel that a little bit myself, so I relate to it a bit. But it does seem like a shift has taken place. I, mean, I don't I don't think we get it. We don't I don't think we get a spectacular explanation about why that shift has changed. We we don't get an explanation of it, but I, I think you're absolutely right. You you said a moment ago as you've as you've gotten older, you've thought about these things more. You you mentioned the fact that uh, that I have a child. I've got a I've got a 14 year old, and if you do the math, I'm 45. So I was a little bit older when we had her, and part of the reason was. Uh, I married at 23. My wife and I uh, married. I was 23. She was 21. And for several years, uh, I just enjoyed being a married couple. And uh, I don't want to say that I was selfish, but, uh, you know, we were enjoying being a young married couple. And it wasn't until I got later into my 20s, I started to struggle with this because, and I'm, I'm going to be very serious and frank for a moment, you know, my 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 dad was absentee so i didn't grow up uh with the influence of a dad he, he my my father and i reconciled our relationship uh the last few years that he was alive but my my father and i didn't have a very good relationship and so i struggled quite frankly with uh what kind of a dad could i possibly be i didn't feel that i had a very good example i was afraid that i would be a failure as a parent i didn't want to uh, make the mistakes that my father made and do the things to my child that not having my dad around did to me. And so it was it was a very difficult time. You talk about introspection. I did a lot of soul searching. But as I rolled on into my late 20s, I started to think about this more and more and, you know, had a desire uh, to have a child. And then my wife and I found out that we weren't able to have uh, children, or at least that's what uh, the doctors determined after about four years of trying and going to doctors and, you know, all through that uh, difficult, difficult uh, period of time in my life in my late 20s and early 30s, you know, the doctor finally determined that uh, we weren't going to be able to have children of our own. And uh, it was actually something quite honestly, quite miraculous uh, that uh, one month after he said that uh, we found out that uh, we were expecting my daughter, and it was a very, very difficult pregnancy. Uh, my wife was uh, on bed rest for 20 weeks during that period of time. It was a, a very trying time. It was a time in which I, I really found myself clinging to my to my faith, and I'm thankful to say that my, my beautiful daughter was born with 10 fingers and 10 toes, you know, much to the amazement of the, of the doctors, and, you know, she's 14 now. She's beautiful. She's healthy. She's smart. Uh, everything that I'm not, and uh, uh, you know, and she's a Trekkie uh, nonetheless. And uh, so, in that regard, I, I relate to Spock a little bit because I think you do as you get older, you start thinking about these things, and uh, you know w- what it would mean to perpetuate uh, your species, if you will, uh, to to parent a child, to pass on you know, what you know, and to at least through your offspring, make the world, try to make the world a better place. Or at least in Spock's case, make the universe a better place, you know, little Spock's running around and make the universe a better place. And I I think he feels the weight of that. I I think he, I think he feels that need. And so he's trying to, he's trying to figure out, you know, what's, what's my, what's my path Do you know, do I perpetuate my species? Do I try to make the universe a better place or, or, or do I, do I, and for Vulcan to say he's going to follow his heart, I, you know, <laughs> but I mean, let's face it, he's he's half human. And so he's got some feelings invested here. He's you know, he's got he's he's got his heart invested into this relationship with uh, Lieutenant Uhura. And uh, so, you know, I can't imagine the the kind of existential crisis that he's in here, because I I do see where he has a longing to. Uh, perpetuate his species. I think that's something that's you know very uh, ingrained in in who we are as a species. But you know he's 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 got feelings for this for this woman. 
Are you saying that he longs to hear the pitter patter of little Vulcan feet and longs to hear the laughter of little Vulcan children? <laughs> <laughs> laughter of Vulcan children? Zachary. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's what I'm saying, right? <laughs> Col- <laughs> Colonar now, Colonar now. <laughs> well, Mike, we've talked a bit about the situation that Captain Kirk finds himself in in Star Trek Beyond. We've talked a bit about the situation that Spock finds himself in. Why don't we spend a little time talking about the main antagonist of the movie, Captain Balthazar Edison, who we meet first meet in Star Trek Beyond as Crawl. Yeah, and I I just want to say, Zachary, uh, just as excited as I was about having Benedict Cumberbatch come in and play the villain, when I found out about the casting for the uh, antagonist for this movie, I was was equally excited. I absolutely love Idris Elba. He is he is a phenomenal actor. I've I've watched the Luther series on Netflix. Uh, which you know, listeners, if you if you haven't seen that, it's one of Idris Elba's uh, earlier series. This is from a few years ago. He's he's brilliant as a as a detective inspector, and of course, we can catch him in the Thor movies. He's just he's just brilliant, and and there's a depth to him. And I was a little bit worried when I saw all the makeup that they were going to put on this guy, but he was able to act right through it. Just a tremendous performance, I think, that he gave. Uh, he was he was creepy, he was scary, and and all the while we we didn't realize that uh, he had a, a dilemma of his own going on. This was a very complicated antagonist. I got to say, the first time I watched uh, Beyond, as much as I love the movie, I felt like one of the things that didn't really add up to me, that didn't make sense, was the motivation of of Crawl, of Balthazar Edison. I, I feel like it was a little overly simplistic to say, you know, I felt like I've been abandoned by the Federation, and so I'm going to go out and kill as many people as I can. It just it just didn't seem to add up, and it, that didn't seem to bother you so much on, on your first viewing of the movie. It didn't, because Zachary, he has been abandoned out there in the frontier for many, many, many years. I, this, you know, this is not something that happened yesterday. Uh, he, you know, he, he the, the interesting thing that I find about Balthazar Edison, and they, they talk about this a little bit in the movie, and, and for all of our Enterprise fans out there, this movie really uh, gives a lot of love to the, to the Enterprise fans. Balthazar Edison was a Mako, and he served during the Zindi War. He served during the Romulan War. He was he he was a soldier, and they talk a little bit about the military being absorbed into Starfleet. So they give him a commission. They make him a starship captain, and they send him out to explore the galaxy. He goes out into the frontier. Uh, his his ship and crew are lost in the frontier, and all we can do is wonder what happened to them. Did a did a giant green space hand grab them? Uh, what happened to them? We don't know, and we don't realize until nearly the end of the movie that this this is the ship and crew, and uh, that our antagonist crawl is not just some uh, alien that's you know worried about the uh, Federation encroaching on his frontier, but he's actually a former Starfleet captain with an axe to grind. He's been, he feels that he's been abandoned out there. And he says to Captain Kirk, I'm going to save the Federation from itself. And I really, I I really felt the weight of what he was saying there. I, I really felt as though he felt that he had come to a place that Federation principles and Federation optimism and Federation root beer just was not for him <laughs> anymore. He'd been abandoned out there and they're not going to do this to another, to another captain. They're going to realize that this level of optimism and exploration comes with consequences. And he's going to be the one uh, to exact that, uh, that penance on them. So it sounds like Captain Kirk has drunk too much Federation Kool-Aid, too much of the root beer, and Balthazar is saying, no more root beer. <laughs> no more root beer. But, you know, all kidding aside, Zachary, I think that is the the, the kind of uh, uh, dilemma that we have here. We've got, 
Captain Kirk, who's drinking the root beer, and Edison's had the root beer, and now it's flat and it's upset his stomach, and here we, there we are. I, f- I feel like this is the kind of issue that's going to make m- more sense to me as I as I watch beyond a few more times. Like right now, I'm 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 struggling a little bit in my mind to weave together these threads. We've got the no more root beer thread. You know, the fact that he feels abandoned by the Federation and he's become skeptical of Federation values. Um, and it's it's also tied up with this sort of militaristic threat uh, question, this militaristic thread. Is Starfleet a military organization or is it fundamentally a non-militaristic uh, organization based around exploration? And, um, you know, this is an issue that Scotty raises. He says explicitly, Starfleet's not a military organization. And, you know, we here we have what's essentially a former soldier that's become that that was turned into a, a Starfleet captain mm-hmm. uh, uh, of this of this warp four ship, the, the USS Franklin. And he's not able to function in that capacity. Um, you know, he's not able to transcend all of his past experience and embrace his role as an explorer as opposed to a soldier, as opposed to a, a warrior. And uh, as I was watching this, the connection that I made in my mind was a connection to Captain Maxwell of the of the Starship Phoenix in that in that Next Generation episode of The Wounded. And if, if you remember that episode of The Next Generation, that captain, Captain Maxwell, uh, can't really function in a time of peace. He was a, a, a highly decorated captain during a time of war, uh, and, but he definitely had an axe to grind against the Cardassians, and that really poisoned his ability to function as a, a Starfleet captain in a time of peace. I see something similar, you know, taken to the extreme uh, with with Captain Edison. You know, it seems like he was just not able to function as an explorer uh, after all that experience, that that terrible experience. You know, he mentions the Romulan War. He sent, mentions the Zindi. You know, he had um, he was a soldier and presumably suffered a bit during those experiences, and he's just not able to transcend that. It's a very tragic tale, I think. Yeah, in fact, there's a there's a conversation between Kirk and Crawl. Kirk says to Crawl, "You won the war. You gave us peace." And Crawl says, "Peace is not what I was born into." And so you can see that militaristic mentality. He's he's got an axe to grind. He's going to find an enemy somewhere because that's that's what he was bred to do. He's a soldier, and so the axe is the Federation who he feels betrayed him that the the Federation in essence has become his enemy. You mentioned Captain Maxwell. I can also see some parallels to Captain Ransom uh, from Equinox on Voyager because just as Captain Ransom has lost the value for another life, so has Kroll, so has Balthazar Edison. He is willing to literally use people in order to regenerate his, his, his own life. He's discovered this technology that literally sucks the life out of other people and transfers it to him. And so I, I see a lot of similarities there to Captain Ransom as well. I love that both Balthazar Edison and Captain Kirk basically make the point that they're a product of their own times. You know, uh, Captain Edison says, that's the world I was born into. And and Captain Kirk says in response, well, this is the world I was born into. And and all of us are like that to some degree. You know, we all are born into a certain time period with a certain set of values and a certain sort of state of affairs of the world. And that's normal to us. And I think the tragic thing here is that it seems clear that uh, in the Star Trek universe, the move towards the Federation and its emphasis on peace and exploration and tolerance and living harmoniously and uh, you know things like the Prime Directive these are these are uh, progressive values inside the Star Trek universe, and it's it's really sad that uh, a character like like Captain Edison can't recognize that progress as progress because he's so stuck in his in his prior worldview. All of his experiences have limited his perspective to the the point where he can't even recognize progress as progress. Yeah, that what that's what makes him such a tragic character. There was a moment near the end of the movie where I thought that he was going to have a moment. I had no doubt in my mind. And again, we should probably preface this by saying, if you haven't seen Beyond, you probably should stop listening right now, go watch the movie and then pick up where you left off. But there was a, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that uh, Balthazar Edison was not going to survive this movie. Uh, You know, you just, you, you know, the way movies are written. I knew Balthazar Edison must die. And so, but there was a moment just before his his death where i thought that somehow he was going to be redeemed you know he and kirk are in that chamber and 
you know, the, um, the weapon is, is loose in there. And I really thought for a second he was going to go and he was going to help Kirk dispel this thing out into space and, and perhaps even sacrifice himself to some degree. And I, you know, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around what happened in that moment because I'm still convinced that, uh, perhaps he was going to, but there were shards of glass floating around there in that space as well. And he sees his reflection in a piece of glass. And I, I don't know, something there, it was like a switch got flipped and he just decides he's going to take, you know, one of those shards of glass and he's going to stab Kirk with it. And, and of course, you know, that, uh, that uh, leads to him getting sucked out into space and uh, and dying uh, uh, as a result of both space and the weapon. But uh, it's what makes him such a tragic character because you can sympathize with him a little bit. He was he was born and bred in the military at a time when his military instincts were needed and necessary. And they took him and they stuck him on the bridge of a ship of exploration and they sent him out uh, to do something that he probably didn't feel equipped to do. And as strongly as you feel about the parallels with Captain Maxwell, and I, I by the way, I would just want to say I concur I also see the the similarities with Ransom because in many ways, Crawl is the result of what happens when Balthazar Edison is disenfranchised, separated from Starfleet principles. The Starfleet principles are what guide these starship captains. You know, many times on Voyager, uh, Chakotay, or occasionally even Tuvok, uh, but definitely the Maquis influences we're oftentimes trying to get Janeway to consider another path, a path that took her away from Federation principles. We're not, we're away from the Federation. We're tens of thousands of light years away from the Federation. We've got to do things different out here. And Janeway always brought them back to our principles are what defines us. I'm not going to let go of them. They're what make us what we are. And it's these principles that are going to keep us intact and get us home. And of course, you know, in the context of Voyager, we, we see that uh, succeeding. And so for Ransom, separated from the principles, we see possibly what could happen when you start to even let go a little bit of those principles. Uh, you know, again, Ransom loses the uh, value, the he loses his understanding of the intrinsic value of life. Um, Captain uh, Balthazar Edison has the same problem. And so uh, to some degree, I think it's a commentary about what happens when we lose sight of, if you will, in this case, Federation principles. You know, having seen Star Trek Beyond only twice now, I struggle a bit to ask myself this fundamental question. What is the message of this movie? You know, what relevance does it have for us today here in the year 2016? And it occurs to me, you know, we, we live in a uh, what is a really a frightening time. We, we live in a time when it's a reality that we will be fighting a perpetual war that in our lifetimes we may not see the kind of peace uh, peaceful times that we've known uh, in, in in previous decades or even when we were younger. You know, there's there's constant militarism and constant, um, you know, adversary an adversarial posture against other nations and other other races and, and whatnot. And it's really a frightening state of affairs. And, um, you know, I think that's the kind of, uh, you know, worldview that this movie is trying to take a stand against. You know, a character like Captain... Uh, uh, Balthazar Edison crawl or uh, in previous the, the previous captains we've talked about Captain Ransom or Captain Maxwell those are uh, characters that would essentially have the Federation fighting a perpetual war they literally can't function in a time of peace and if a peaceful time is there they're going to make war because that's what they're, <laughs> what they're familiar with and comfortable with and I think that's a, that should frighten all of us that we live in a time when we could have, be fighting in one form or another a perpetual state of war that will never end 
And, you know, here comes Captain Kirk, you know, encountering um, uh, Balthazar Edison to say, look, there's another way. We can't keep doing that. We have to change or we'll keep fighting battles again and again and again. He says we'll keep fighting the same battles. Mm -hmm. But I think here in the real world, we'll keep fighting some sort of battle or not. And we have to decide what kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want a world where we keep, um, you know, uh, where the goal is to keep, you know, finding the next engagement, (laughs) you know, to, to find the next war to fight? Or is the goal to try to find a way, you know, however difficult it is to find a better way to do things, to find a, to re- reclaim that state of, of peacefulness that all of us, I think, crave down inside, except for the people that really do crave, crave war and disharmony. And um, in my mind, I think that's, you know, that's the best I can do right now, having only seen the movie twice to come up with a message to this movie. It's just this stark contrast between um, not being able to let go of the past and not being able to function in a time of peace and, cr- and, and, and cultivating that kind of, of, of uh, harmful chaos in the world around you or trying to find a better way and really embrace this notion of progress that we can move beyond those things if we make this conscious effort. And Captain Kirk is the symbol of how to do um, how to, in, in the movie. I think it is a symbol of how to do find a better way. How you know he's a symbol of all of the Federation and it's it's uh, it's movement beyond this this restricting, uh, harmful um, you know being stuck in the past. Uh, uh, you know, lifestyle that, 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 that Balthazar Edison embraces, you know, he basically embraces, you know, being stuck in the past, not being willing to change, starting a war if there isn't one around you because he can't function in a time of peace. And, you know, I think the movie does a very good job of portraying the Federation as a counterpoint to that approach. And, and we can see that here in the real world. You know, there are people in this world who would have us fighting a perpetual mm-hmm. War, and there are people who say, "No, we can't do that. We have to find a better way, however difficult it is." And that's what real progress is. And I think that that progressiveness versus—I want to say press, progressiveness versus conservatism. I don't think that's right. I think it's progressiveness versus militarism. You know, do we is the goal to have a strong military society and make that a fundamental part of who we are, or is the goal to transcend those weaker parts of human nature and try to you know be the best version of ourselves and whatever new frontier that creates? You know, that's a different world than the world we live in today, but isn't that progress? And I think Captain Edison just can't even recognize that as a good thing. You know, if we could transcend war, wouldn't that be an amazing thing? I think to me the answer is obvious. Yeah, if 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 we can not have wars in the world what a better world that would be. But that's not true for everyone. There are people for whom that would be a bad thing and they are stuck in this in this way of thinking that that war is an ideal in some way. And that's a twisted state of affairs. And I think there are there are people in the world who have that view today. And I think it's, it's very frightening. So you wouldn't have been a bit surprised if Crawl would have been walking along and started in the minstrel boy to the war is gone. <laughs> <laughs> in the ranks of death you will find him <laughs> well s- s- we don't know <laughs> it's not a scottish song so scotty wouldn't join in. <laughs> I- i'd like to hear the beastie boys singing that though that, that would have been great that would have been great I gotta say, I I love the use of the the use of the Beastie Boys music in, in this movie. I, it was so much fun. This like sheer just rock and roll, you know, chaos with stuff blowing up. It was such a, a visually and, and and auditorily powerful scene. I love. Well, it. if you recall, I believe that was the same music that Young Kirk was playing in the Corvette before he run it over a cliff so absolutely that, that's, it was. that yeah. scene where he gets that look at his eye it says great song <laughs> that was that was fantastic i so so am i off base on this i think that that's my takeaway from the movie that there that it just shows that the federation is trying to seek a better way to do things and it just shows that if you if you're not along for the progressive ride you know if you're not out to make the world a better place you're a dinosaur and you've got some problems <laughs> and, and i think that this movie takes a pretty strong stance on on that kind of militaristic view of the world and and contrasts it with a more progressive a star trek progressive view I, that that's the best takeaway i've got for for us here in 2016 right now yeah i i have to agree with you on on all points absolutely i th- i think you're i think you're right on the money the last thing i i want to mention before we go to uh before we go to our final thoughts i i ha i just want to say on just from from a uh, uh just a, a sheerly fan perspective this doesn't really play into uh any of the deep uh philosophical threads but uh I, I just want to say that for a movie in which uh, 
Leonard wasn't there to join in. I felt like he was uh, so well represented in the movie, and I feel that uh, the movie did a great deal to pay tribute uh, to Leonard and to his contribution to Star Trek and to the Star Trek universe. Uh, it was very touching. Uh, I'm so glad uh, that e even though it was just a mention uh, at the end of the movie for Anton, uh, I, I just felt that the movie was uh, uh, really a, a, a moving tribute uh, to both of both those incredible actors, one uh, much older and one uh, younger, two actors, one at the end of his career and one who was just starting his career. But uh, what a what a what a touching tribute to both of them. I was really moved by the scene at the end when when Captain Kirk toasts to absent friends. You know, of course, it's a callback to Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. We saw that in Star Trek Nemesis. And it, it, it's become this theme, um, you know, whenever we lose someone in the Star Trek universe, it's two absent friends becomes the, the standard toast. And uh, but in this case, I was really moved. You know, I, I grew up watching uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, of course, but, you know, um, I used to watch the original series with my dad and, and just, you know, we've got years and years of Star Trek history. I grew up watching the Star Trek movies, all of the original series mm -hmm. movies. Uh, probably I think the first one I saw in the theater was Star Trek V. Um, and then, of course, I watched all the others in in, uh, in, uh, on, in on television and on VHS, if anyone remembers what VHS is. Um, I, I was really touched because I think it's as much as we've been talking about the future and progressiveness, I think it's also important for us to remember where we came from. I think in the Star Trek universe, it's, it's good to continue to reach back to what Gene Roddenberry's vision went, was. And it's good to reach back to the things that the original... Uh, cast brought to those roles and brought to what we know as the Star Trek universe. How, whatever new things we see in Star Trek, that's where it all started. Those people, um, you know, Gene Roddenberry and the 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 original writers of the original series and the original actors. That is the the seed from which this beautiful thing we know as the Star Trek universe sprang. And it's good to keep looking back at that and and reminding ourselves how good that was. <laughs> and um, you know, as we continue to lose people in the Star Trek universe, you know, we're going to continue to Sadly, we're going to continue to lose the cast members from the original series. We unexpectedly and tragically lost Anton Yelchin. And I, I was actually surprised. I'm glad you mentioned this because we didn't get a chance to talk about this on Metatrex when when uh, we first heard of Anton Yelchin's death. I was surprised how moved I really was by that. You know, as much as I was uh, fairly critical of the Kelvin timeline, it occurred to me when his death occurred that that the actors and the this part of the Star Trek universe has seeped its way into my into my uh, subconscious, you know, in in some deeper way, a more emotional way. I was more emotionally attached to this version of these characters than I'd given myself credit for, and it, I was really uh, just touched and moved to see a tribute to to the original cast uh, in the form of the uh, photograph from Leonard uh, from from Elder Spock's belongings. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, um, you know, the toast absent friends with Anton Yelchin there in the scene, those were moving experiences for me, given my emotional attachment to this universe and these characters and these actors. Um, and uh, I, I was more moved by that than I, than I might have given myself credit for a week ago. And I think this is just an important part of life, too. I mean, we, you know, in so much as, as we think that the Star Trek universe is progressive, and we've talked a lot about that in the last, excuse me, in the last few minutes, um, I think that it's it's equally important to remember who we are, you know, in our past and how we got here. And uh, and, and I think this movie actually uh, provides a really interesting contrast to two different ways to do that. You know, Balthazar Edison is a character who is stuck in the past, right? He he can't move into the future. He can't move beyond his militarism. And that's a bad way of being stuck in the past. But, you know, looking back at where we came from, remembering the best parts of ourselves, you know, in, in our past experiences and in, in world history, I think that's an important reminder of, of what we can continue to strive for and what we should try to preserve as we continue to move into the future. So, you know, as, as progressive as this movie is in, in, its, in its claims about what humanity and what um, uh, the Federation can be, it, it provides two different ways of looking at the past as well. You, know, you can look at the past and be stuck in it and not being willing to move into the future with the rest of us. Or you can look at the past and um, you know, try to remember the best parts of who we are, not forget about, you know, 
what 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 it took for us to get here and, and the best parts of, uh, of what we've seen in, in world history and in our past experiences. Uh, I think it just boils down to, you know, being willing to recognize the good things for, as good things, not forgetting about them, uh, continuing to pay tribute to them and carrying all of that into the future and try to make an even better world in the future. And, and I, I just think that, that, that contrast between two different ways of approaching our relationship with the past is, is a very, um, you know, a very poignant in this day and age. I think you can be so progressive that you forget the best parts of who we were. You can forget the struggles of people in the past. You can forget the virtues that people in the past have had. Uh, and you can be so um, stuck in the past that you can't move into the future. You can't, you know, you, where you cease trying to make the world a better place and you don't even recognize progress as progress. And you, both of those things are, are tragic. And so just, you know, looking at the past and putting it in perspective and finding the best parts of who we were in the past, but not being stuck in the past. This movie is a very interesting, um, a, a very interesting play on two different ways of approaching the past. Yeah, I agree. David Hume said a man acquainted with history may in some respect be said to have lived from the beginning of the world and to have been uh, making continual additions to the stock of his knowledge in every century. And so I, I, I appreciate the fact that in approaching this movie, they really drew from what makes Star Trek great. And they, they tell a really interesting story. And in some respects, Zachary, it's it's almost a message to fans, I think. You talked about how you can get stuck in that past. And I think, to some respect, there are fans out there who have been uh, somewhat stuck in the past. We, uh, you know, we, to, to the point that we can't appreciate uh, Star Trek for what it is. See, I remember when Star Trek The Next Generation came on. Uh, television, the, you know, there was, I was, you know, I was a teenager at the time, but I can still remember original series Star Trek fans just, just losing their minds. I mean, they were just losing their minds over, you know. You mean Star Trek without Captain Kirk? <laughs> Star Trek without. How is that possible? How is that possible? And yet we've done it time and time again, but without losing sight of what makes Star Trek really, really great. And I really feel like they got that right in this movie. I think they rediscovered what makes Star Trek great. And they told a new story and a new universe in a, in a, in a just a fantastic way. We've pulled a couple of threads out of here. But I really want to encourage our listeners to jump in on the conversation. When this show drops, we'll have a thread on the Babel Conference. That's Trek FM's listeners only discussion group. It's a closed group, but if you hit the uh, hit the button and ask, we'll, we'll let you right in and uh, jump in on this thread and tell us what philosophical themes you picked up on in Star Trek Beyond, and let's let's discuss those because Zachary, you and I don't have an exhaustive list here by any means. These are just some initial things that in your first two viewings and my first viewing that we kind of latched onto and felt that they were worth exploring here on Metatrex. But there, there's plenty more in there. And I, I said this to you Saturday when we had our uh, meeting that I, I really felt like this movie had a lot going on, philosophically speaking, and which is really surprising for a, a two-hour movie. I felt that they packed a lot into it. And so we've just pulled a few themes here uh, that jumped out at us, but there's certainly more. And I hope our, our listeners will uh, jump on the thread and, and let's discuss those. We can certainly uh, uh, dissect these a little bit. Maybe you agree, maybe you disagree with us. Let's let's talk about it. Let's, uh, let's explore this a little bit more. Maybe you picked up on something that we didn't mention. Certainly hope that our, our listeners will jump in. But just by way for my final thoughts, I just want to say again, just on the surface, I, I, I love this movie. Uh, all the things that I love about Star Trek, I, I feel like they captured and they really took me on a journey in, in these in these two hours. It was a journey that was packed with uh, with action and with really interesting uh, character plays. There were really great philosophical themes, some introspection going on. Uh, it just it just had everything that that I think really makes a great Star Trek movie. And so, uh, you know, I'm planning on going to see it again this weekend. I think you're absolutely right. I think there's a strong message there about uh, the need uh, to 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 look back, but not to get stuck in the past, not to get stuck in a rut, but to to continually grow and that that Starfleet principle of optimism and exploration it can really take us 
in, into uh, an exciting future if we allow it, if we, if we can look back and learn from the past but continually move and progress forward. But there will always be, uh, there will always be crawls out there to push back uh, there on the frontier. So we have to be prepared for that. And there's strength and unity. That was a big takeaway message uh, for me, Zachary, is that if we if we stick together, if we work together, we really can solve seemingly impossible problems and make the world, make the universe a better place. That's that's my final thoughts. Yeah, in, in that sense, all of the the entire crew of the Enterprise is a metaphor for all of us, right? They work together better as a group. And if, if that's true of us as well, that society functions better when we work together rather than work at cross purposes, I, I think that's a, that's a great metaphor for everything we've been talking about. I think for my final thoughts, I, I don't know if I need to say any more about the fact that I loved this movie. It was Like I said, it was the most fun I've, I've had at a Star Trek movie in a long so time. So you really love this re- movie, Zachary? I really love this movie. Yeah, I, I don't, did. Th- I don't and, think our uh, listeners really get that we love this movie. I... Well, when, when was the last time we were able to say that? I just love this Star Trek movie, right? I mean, it's been a little been while. A while. I mean, even 2009 was good, but I, I, I'd, I'd be hard-pressed to say I love Star Trek 2009. You know, I, I enjoyed this one more than I enjoyed Star Trek 2009, and uh, I, I probably haven't had this much fun at a Star Trek movie since First Contact, and, and, and that's a long time. <laughs> you know, that's, that's 20 years, right? Um, and, uh, you know, philosophically, I think it'll be interesting to see what I have to say about this in the future. Uh, I've never frankly been in this position where I've been podcasting about brand new Star Trek, right? You know, all this, all the Star Trek we've talking, been talking about so far on Metatrex, um, involves stuff I've seen, you know, tens or 20, 20 times, right? <laughs> you know, it's sunk in pretty good. I've, I've got my, my head wrapped around what it all means. And I think just, just like the original series is a product of its time, right? The original series comes out of the sixties, comes out of the cold war, uh, it informs a lot of the message that you get inside the original series. Um, and I think that's true of almost any iteration of Star Trek. I think, you know, Star Trek The Next Generation is very much a product of the 1980s and, and the optimism that you get in, the, in, in that decade. Uh, I think Star Trek Into Darkness is very much a product of the, the last, you know, 10 plus years now of a war in Iraq and a war in Afghanistan and this dreariness of, 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 of the threat of war and what that means and the toll that it's taken on all of us, on society on individual people, um, the soldiers and, and, uh, and veterans who've, who, who were there in doing the fighting. I think, um, you know, what does that mean for us in 2016? I, I don't really, we're too close to it, right? We don't know what Star Trek Beyond means uh, in, in 2016 yet because we're just too close to it. You know, in, in two years or five years or 10 years, I think we'll have a much better perspective on how this movie fits into, you know, what's going on in the culture and, and what the real deep meaning is. You know, and I, I think it'll fit together more as, as, as time goes goes on. Um, you know, we've identified a number of interesting threads from the existentialism, uh, uh, existentialist dilemma that that um, Kirk and Spock find themselves in at the beginning of Star Trek Beyond. We talked about the question of obligation to, uh, you know, your race or to the future or to the environment. We talked about militarism and, uh, you know, whether being stuck in the past versus uh, versus, you know, taking a leap into the future and doing it together as a group. These are these are fascinating threads. But uh, again, I feel like I'll understand this movie more as I see it. And I look forward to looking back on this once it you know becomes a more uh, a more firmly ingrained part of my my star trek uh viewing history and my my cultural consciousness and um you know i by no means do we here on metatrex have the final word you know after having only seen this movie you know once for you and twice for me these are just our initial thoughts on star trek beyond and i, I hope we can revisit it a, a bit down the road when we when it's had a chance to sink in a bit more like i said it's it's not that's not to say that it was a terrible movie it was a wonderful movie um it's just that the, the threads are have not gelled together into a coherent picture in my mind at least of the ultimate meaning of the uh, and message of this movie for us here in 2016 just yet well, it's been a lot of fun talking about Star Trek Beyond today, but this isn't the only thing we've been talking about here on Trek FM this past week, so here's a quick look at some of the other things you may have missed elsewhere on the network. Previously on Trek.fm, The Ready Room. The DNA of Star Trek fandom, and I've said it before, fandom existed, fandom enjoyed the show, but the main charge of fandom was to get the damn thing back. Warp 5. The Romulans had their ship in season four that had the holograms mm-hmm. that made it look yeah. like any other ship. So you could theoretically retcon Minefield into saying they were using that same technology back then. Literary Treks. We have a long tradition here on Literary Treks of taking things seriously and having a good time while doing that. Tonight, 
Well, we were going to take it seriously, but then the comics wouldn't let us. The 602 Club. Yeah, I, you know, I, I had a similar experience where, you know, I was talking to a, a guy, the new movie's coming out, obviously, and I'm like, have you seen the, the first one? And he's like, no, I haven't. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, let me bring it to you so you can you can take a look. And he watched it, and he came back the next day, and he's like, oh, yeah, that movie was really good. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out these shows and find out what we're talking about in your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button. That helps us out greatly and makes it easier for other listeners to find the shows as they search iTunes. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, and of course you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website and grab the RSS link as well. Another way you can help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week is to become a patron of the network through Patreon. If you visit patreon.com slash trekfm, that's patreo dot com slash trekfm, you'll find our current goals and different milestone contribution levels, along with all of the great perks we have for you. These perks include early access to content, exclusive content, producer credits, seats on our content development team, and many more. We really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. And don't forget to check out Enterprise in Space, a project of the nonprofit National Space Society that will design and launch an 8-foot orbiter and return the craft to Earth. The NSS Enterprise Orbiter will carry more than 100 student design science experiments into space, and you can help make it happen. Visit enterpriseinspace.org to find out more and to get your seat on the mission. If you'd like to contact us with feedback or suggestions for the show, or to send us your thoughts on anything we discussed in this episode of Metatrex, you can contact us in several different ways. You can contact us via a form on Trek FM's website. Just go to trek.fm slash contact. You can also leave us a voicemail. Look in the sidebar on the show page or go to speakpipe.com slash trekfm. We'd love to share your voicemail here on the podcast. On Twitter, you can find us under the handle at trekfm. On Facebook, you can find us at facebook.com slash trekfm. And while you're there, don't forget to check out the Babel Conference. Just type the Babel Conference, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook or go to our website at trek.fm and click discussion on the menu bar. We also invite you to leave a rating and a review of Metatrex on iTunes. We'd love to hear your feedback and suggestions for the show. Well, Mike, when you're not daydreaming of Warp 4 starships, where can our listeners find you on the interwebs and around the Trek FM network? Well, Zachary, I'm most active on Facebook. You can find me certainly around the Babel Conference on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at cmichael1701. I'm also on Instagram, cmichael1701. And Zachary, when you're not contemplating your moral obligations to the species over Chekhov's scotch, where can our listeners find you around the network and on the interwebs? Well, you can find me on Facebook in the Babel Conference, Trek FM's listeners-only discussion group, if you want to talk about Star Trek and philosophy with me there. And you can also find me on Twitter. My handle is just my name, at Zachary Fruling. That's Zachary, Z-A-C-H-A-R-Y, Fruling, F-R-U-H-L-I-N-G. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the rest of the Metatrex team from the network, specifically C. Brian Jones, the founder and publisher of Trek.fm, our executive producers, Charlene Schmidt, Matthew Rushing, and Norman Lau, Aaron Harvey, our art director, and Richard Marquez, our production manager. We'd also like to give a special thank you to our two associate producers for Metatrex, Patrick Devlin and Kay Elizabeth Janeway. You can find Patrick under the Twitter handle at MagicDrop5, and you can find Kay Elizabeth Janeway under the Twitter handle at ChocoWeeble. Well, everyone, thanks for listening to Metatrex, a Star Trek philosophy podcast. Until next time, when we will once again boldly go where no philosophers have gone before. <laughs> <laughs>